Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Arcadia Q&A stream. My name is James Ducasso. I am the managing editor of Arcadia, and we are going to talk to the authors about Arcadia 12 today. We are going to dive deep into each article. We're getting into spoiler territory, so you have been warned if you're worried about spoilers for adventures or encounters or anything like that. Our first author here is Connor. Connor, introduce yourself and let people know uh, who you are and what you did for Arcadia. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Connor. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, my author's credit lists me as Jonathan Connor Self. Uh, I am, by day, a mental health counselor. Uh, in the evening, I freelance uh, creating awesome RPG content for folks, um, uh, including uh, this, this really delightful article for Arcadia 12 that I've been wanting to write for so long. Um, so I want to thank the team over at MCDM uh, for giving me the opportunity. Um, yeah, that's me. <laughs> well, thank you so much for writing it. I'm really excited to talk to you about this article um, because it's got some of my favorite stuff in it. When you pitched it, I was so excited, right? It's this idea of Fae who live in the shadow fell. So give us the high level overview and then you and I are going to dive deep into this article and tell everybody what it's about and what they can expect. But what's what's the big picture pitch for this? Well, so when I initially pitched it, I wanted to provide dungeon masters who are interested in adding more fey to their game uh, a, a couple tools that they could use uh, to 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 help tell those stories. We all know right now there is a big hole, even after release of that amazing adventure book uh, by Wizards, there's still a huge hole in this game as far as uh, fey creatures. And I'm not talking just adversaries, I'm talking uh uh, Faye that can be not only your enemy, but also your ally or friend, even if they're they're a little bit more of the unsavory variety. Um, and so what I want to do is, uh, even more important than providing some stat blocks, I want to provide a tool set that DMs could use to help uh, design those Faye for their games. Um, and so we started from the, from the top level, providing examples of how to change uh, Faye to fit a different flavor for your game, going into how to use uh, some existing Fey, uh, and, and, and sort of work within that framework to create new adversaries. And then just pulling some other really fun myths from around the world uh, to, uh, to add new Fey to your games. Um, and so and I try to clarify that process a little bit. Oh, excellent. That's awesome. So let's start at the beginning of the article here. Tell me what makes Fey who live in the Shadow Fell different? Why Fey, you know, like uh, what makes them still Fey, but also what makes them different in the Shadow Fell? All right. So that's a really good question. Um, so if, if you really dig into the source of Fey, uh, Dungeons and Dragons is a game ultimately about mythologies and stories. It's stories that we tell each other. These are stories that uh, are not only new to us, but they're stories that have been passed down from generation to generation. Uh, going back millennia, some of our stories, uh, some of our stories exist, and fairy tales are some of the oldest stories. Um, and at the center of your typical fairy tale, um, oftentimes are fairies. Um, and regardless of where you live. Um, uh, on this world, there's something about the fairy tale, that fairy element that transcends all cultures, regardless of where you're at. And, and so um, we know that these have to be some of the oldest tales that we humans have, uh, because we've seen them pop up over and over again worldwide. The, um, the thing about Fae of the Shadowfell is that in the stories, Fae uh, are often used to teach a lesson uh, uh, and those lessons often have to do with either nature and life in general or emotions or feelings. And so and so typically your fey um, uh, embody one or both of these qualities. Uh, you see that in the um, in the in the great uh, the great Seely uh, elves who um, who run kingdoms, uh, project nobility, uh, and sort of embody uh, the nature of the area around them. And, and you see a lot of that in the in the folk of of Iceland um, and uh, and the Germanic peoples. Um, but you also see creatures such as the red cap, 
which uh, was really heavy in Germanic myth. Uh, and they embodied violence and bloodshed uh, and cruelty and death. And so that's not a natural thing so much as it is an emotional thing. The cosmology of 5e is set up that these outer planes aren't places so much as states of existence. And they bring out different facets of what it means for all of us as players being human. And so because each of these other realms have their own emotional flavors because fey are often told as emotional components in stories or they represent emotional states it only makes sense that you should be able to find fey just about everywhere that you could find living creatures who experience emotions um and so there's no reason why they shouldn't exist on the shadow fell or the material plane or anywhere else even if they call the fey wild their native home Um, Anywhere you find living creatures that feel, you should find the manifestation of that, which is a fae. That's excellent. And I think that's really great. That's how your article opens up, uh, giving a a brief overview of that and discussing. And then we jump right into uh, the new stat blocks and kinds of fae that you have here in this article. So take me through, because first you start with like familiar fae, fae that we have seen maybe in the monster manual that now you are taking and you are giving us a a couple of variations on those. Um, So why don't you take us through those start? Starting with the the necro dryad, uh, which I think is just awesome, and I've already used it in my game. In fact, I used it before it was published because I was so excited uh, about this one. Awesome! So uh, that's cool that you mentioned the necro dryad is one of my favorites. Um, from a story standpoint, we know uh, in existing D and D lore, and not just that in the in the stories of ancient Greece, where the dryad comes from, uh, that these particular fey are linked to trees um, and that when that tree is killed, uh, the, the Fae often uh, goes into a fit of anger and rage until the Fae eventually dies. Um, but that's where the story ends, that the, the, the Fae dies. But just because the Fae dies doesn't mean the memory of the tree dies uh, or the memory of the Dryad. So uh, the Necro Dryad is just the next transition uh, in a Dryad's life cycle. Um, where they where they move from being a creature of life to a creature of memory. Uh, uh, for the DM, I wanted to provide an example of how you could change a couple abilities on the character sheet to reflect that nature. And so it, it, it provides the easiest introduction to how to adapt Fey uh, to fit your campaign in the Shadowfell. That's excellent. And after, you know, we have just a few little things that you change that it makes a really a totally different creature, right? And resistance to ne- uh, necrotic damage. Um, we change the type, of course, to undead um, because, as <laughs> you alluded to, in death, D&D is not the end. And, uh, you know, instead of Goodberry, maybe they cast and flick wounds. Uh, it is, uh, it's just great. And I love that there's this little extra bit where you talk about tree stride allows it to, um, allows the necro drive to move from dead tree to dead tree as opposed to living trees, which is really a lot of fun. Um, then we start to get into the hags. Uh, I know that Arcadia readers, big hag fans. I am obviously a big <laughs> hag fan. It's not the first time they've graced the pages here in Arcadia. Uh, tell me a little right. bit about your new hags that you've introduced here, the red hag and the storm hag. I think the red hag is 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 particularly interesting. It was inspired um, by some of the uh, some of the stories, um, uh, some of the mythology of Japan, um, where uh, they spoke often about a plague spirit that would move down from the mountains and devour the living, uh, inflict their bodies with with horrible diseases, um, and then devour their flesh. Um, as uh, as a story to 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 help uh, uh, folks understand and and rightfully at the time without modern medicine fear um, disease and so it was a great thing to to pull into it and show that um, that this particular form of story the story of the of the uh, of the fearful uh, the fearful presence um, in nature that will prey upon the living for uh for their own 
glee sustenance uh, that it, it transcends um, just the, the mythology of Western Europe and um, and and the culture of, of, of we here in America. Uh, so that was kind of fun. Uh, the other cool thing about it is that the story's uh, very readily told that people, particularly brave people, uh, w- would seek uh, would seek these spirits out in their homes uh, and provide favors in exchange for vital information to save uh, to save uh, their their villages, to save their families, and so even here from a, from a from a perspective of you know this is a horrible creature, and I mean I really like describing them because they they're viciously disgusting. Um, this is still some uh, somebody who you could work with, um, and 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 keeping in mind that even when Fey are often at their darkest, they still could be erstwhile allies in the right situation. Um, so that was kind of cool. I really I really loved pulling pulling in uh, uh, that inspiration. Uh, the uh, the storm hag is one of my favorites uh, because. Uh, Everywhere we go, we, we look for mythology, and the storm hag is actually current mythology. Um, uh, the, the storm hag uh, is uniquely American, uh, and uh, and the uh, it's a spirit that resides uh, in Lake Erie that's been reputed to cause many shipwrecks, many as late as the 1940s, World War II. Um, so uh, if you live along Lake Erie in perhaps, uh, you know, the, uh, the Cleveland to Buffalo range line there on, on the lake, um, this might be a story that you would have heard the roots of already. Um, many unexplained shipwrecks. And they said that it was often a storm where you heard singing before the storm hit your ship and ripped it apart. And so and so it was really fun to tell that story of, of seaside loss and woe um, uh, in, in, the, in the framework of, of a fey tale. It was also yeah, really cool to add like a really powerful fey into the game because we didn't have any that powerful. And... Uh, and CR twenty three is no joke. <laughs> yeah, exactly. One of my favorite things about this article is hags, as described in the game, often feel like end level bosses, and then it's like, well, yeah, but the night hag is CR five, right? Um, and maybe right. in a coven, a little more powerful. But uh, but that's you have given people now s- some hags, particularly with the storm hag, right? This hag uh, has legendary actions and lair actions, and is CR twenty three. That is an end boss for sure, and even for sure shorter games um the red hag at cr9 uh could be pretty interesting i do need to call out that your red hag also has a lick attack um that uh, gives you (laughs) wounds that fester and continue to damage you which i think is pretty cool uh and fits that theme again of of disease and everything but i love that all of this like you said ties back to the idea too that these aren't just bags of hit points to fight um these are also creatures that uh can inject a lot of drama in your story and also make the characters think a little bit before they draw their swords and wands and go right into battle, right? That there's, hey, maybe we can work with this person. Maybe our goals are aligned in some way. Right. And, and that's absolutely critical, James. Uh, you hit the nail on the head there. Whenever you're telling um, a fate tale, it can't just be one about beating that that creature in combat um because these these are embodiments of these old tales about personal safety about about feeling about emotion about the nature that you have to live with um even if you're afraid of it you can't just kill a face spirit because there's nothing to stop it from coming back you have to you have to learn how to work within it and survive within that framework and and um and and not just fight against it but ally with it, and so and so, it's it's really cool that uh, that uh, you gave me the opportunity to do that, and not only that, James, you really encouraged that, and I, I thank you a lot for that. Oh, it was excellent. It was it was really excellent to work with someone who had this perspective of like, we want to make these monsters uh, fun in combat, but we also want to make them more interesting than that. And mm-hmm. and you could build around all of these monsters entire adventures, which I think is uh, is really great. Um, which brings us to the Fomorian Theurge. Uh, talk to me about this. This is uh, a, a just an incredible. I have to say, like Fomorians as written, um, kind of. 
kind of little bit of a snooze fest, right? Like they have some interesting things going right. for them. But this uh, this not only in stat block form, but also in lore form for me, really expanded my ideas of what a Fomorian could be. So talk to me about it. Well, that, it's, it's awesome that you bring that up. Uh, the Fomorian isn't something that uh, was just magically created in D&D. This is a very, very ancient foe. Um, and if you consult uh, old tales and old mythology of the ancient Celts, you find repeated stories, not only of the she, you know, the, uh, the who we know in their current form in D&D as the Eladrin, you also find stories of their eternal foes, the Fomorians. And... Um, and if you, if you if you do, even in Dungeons & Dragons, if you do a lore dive, you find out that the Fomorians themselves are not native to the material world any more than, than the Fae are. Um, they are giants indeed. They do live underground, but that's because in their in their true homes and the other planes, that's where they live. They're, they're native to the Fae wild, um, and they often burrow to the Shadowfell. And so um, being able to include that, but... but taking them up to the level where they're supposed to be because these aren't foes that uh, certainly they were cursed with hideousness in the tales. Um, but these were not foes that hit you with a club and expected to be, d- to be done. They were every bit as magical as the, as the, she, uh, the creatures that became the Aladrin in our stories today. And so not giving them, uh, that opportunity, uh, you know, I, I feel like that was a big oversight. Uh, not linking them to the Fae were, because their history is like inseparably bound in our myth, in our mythos to them. It, you know, it 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 does them justice to include the Fomorians in tales of Fae. Yes, and it absolutely. was really cool to hear about some really cool elemental magic too. That was that was really fun. Yeah, absolutely. And this is, um, you know, this is a great creature uh, in terms of like, you want something that uh, can spit fire, lightning and and frost everywhere. Um, This is one for you. But again, there's a rich history here that we have tied in that I think makes it uh, just a a more interesting creature to role playing, gives the GM a lot of plot hooks to hang their hats on. Um, But it's also a really interesting stat block if that's really what you're looking for here. We've got that going on, which, you know, leads into then the three other creatures that you have created for this. Now, these are creatures that we don't have familiarity with in D&D, but you did draw from, uh, you know, real world mythologies uh, and and lore to bring these in. So take me through these three um, and tell me what you love about them uh, and, and what's cool and what do you think is exciting about each of them? Well, so which one do you want me to start with? Do you want me to start with the Lubberkin? Do you want me to start with... Uh, oh, yeah. Let's let's start with the Lubberkin because that is my favorite. Okay. So the Lubberkin is a really, really interesting story. Um, the uh, there, there are stories uh, about the spirits that will reside in monasteries and nunneries <laughs> and and would lead the pious people uh you know uh, uh, of uh, uh you know of of their faiths down a road of debauchery um usually through the the world of drink um and other things that I'm not going to get into because this is a family podcast and and so i i you know i it was such a, a, a rich story um, that's so uh, a, a rich mythology that's so um, full of emotion, um, but also instructive. That I thought it would be a waste if we didn't find a way to include it in this article. They were they 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 set up the fate to tell a very very different story than you currently get with the existing monsters, um, but have a, a bevy of new abilities um, that are unique. Um, so, uh, you know, the, uh, the ability not only to land a, a couple punches because, uh, because the Lubberkin in, in, uh, at least in the more recent, uh, poems, uh, that, that talk about them were, were big gi- giant ish creatures, the size of ogres. Um, they sort of remind me of my favorite Muppet. Um, but, uh, well, you know, really tall and kind of hairy, um, you know, uh, it was, but uh, could be incredibly pleasant mm-hmm. because that's how they infiltrated, and and then slowly 
would change the culture of the of the place that where they were at. The um, the ability to to uh, to exhale to 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 vaporize uh, alcohol magically to uh, to intoxicate the uh, the opponents um, as as a as a potentially harmful ability, but also one that they might potentially use outside of combat too was was really fun. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, I'm I'm just really excited to hear the sorts of stories that the dungeon masters are going to tell with those. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think I, I think there's a lot of fun to be had there, right? Especially with um, you said you've integrated some of the mechanics into this creature, um, but I think there's also like that's built in adventure, right? One of these things shows up on the scene. Things get weird at the local temple, uh, and you're off to the races, right? Trying to figure out what it is, how did this happen? Um, I just think it's it's got a lot of fun going on. Now let's talk right. about the bogey. <laughs> oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, ooh, ooh, uh, because because one thing that the lubberkin does is it changes uh, the culture of of the monastery to become more like a cult. Um, it also right. sets up for familiar religious figures. Uh, to be antagonists in your story, um, so that's also a, a great little a great little thing that's that's worth mentioning. If you're if you're looking to tell a tale where the people that were often consulted uh, for their wisdom and their piety suddenly aren't, <laughs> right, um, right. either wise <laughs> or pious, um, you know that 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 can give you some invasion of the body snatchers vibes for sure. Um, yes, the absolutely. next one. Yeah, go ahead. Well, the next one was. The bogey. Talk to me about the bogey. The bogey. <laughs> I, okay, so a personal favorite of mine uh, is the bogey. Uh, the bogey is a long-standing myth um, worldwide uh, about the creature that scares children at night. Um, this is the boogeyman. Uh, this is the this is the creature that lives under your bed or lives in the dark spaces of your closet. And at night, when you're at your most vulnerable, it comes out to terrorize you. Um, and this is a very, very primal uh, uh, fay that really gets at um, all of the innocence that many of us still harbor inside, the childlike innocence um, that, the, that the bogey actively combats. And so I wanted to, uh, I wanted to help bring that mythology into the game uh, with a, with a monster that could get at that that state of fear um, that all of us have experienced in our youth. And so uh, giving the uh, the bogey abilities that allow it to uh, to pick one particular uh, one particular uh, person that they draw sustenance off of, uh, the ability to terrorize them with psychic damage, the ability to teleport through shadows and dark spaces. So no, it wasn't in your closet when your parents went to check it. <laughs> but it teleports yes. into your closet after they go. Or it wasn't under your bed. Your parents looked, they shone, they shone the candle under your bed yourself and you saw it wasn't there until the dark spaces when you can hear the scratching at the bottom of your mattress. You know, that that is the bogey. Um, and and I wanted to uh, to help tell the story by giving it abilities that allowed it to do those things. It is the monster who should lurk at the periphery um, until it's almost too late. You know, um, that, that, that was really what I wanted to, to get at with that monster and its stat block. And I, I hope that Dungeon Masters can take it and, and use its uh, use its abilities as inspiration for how to tell uh, tales of terror in uh, in your games at home. So. Yeah, yeah, totally. I I love this one because it is so much the boogeyman. It is so much the monster under the bed. Um, and again, you've got that delicious built-in story, but I think super relatable. I mean, who among us as children didn't have a particular place like in the neighborhood or in your house or, uh, you know, uh, under your bed, whatever, that you were not scared of. And this, like, immediately brings that back. And the fact that the uh, features and traits of this creature can do that is great. And now that brings us to what might be, what, what for me was the most uh, unusual of fey creatures, one that I didn't know any bun, anything about, uh, the fachin um, or fachin, uh, depending on how you pronounce it. 
I looked up both pronunciations. This is a Scottish monster. Uh, talk to me a little bit about about this bad boy. It is a Scottish monster, but it's not exclusively Scottish because if you take a look, the mythology of that particular creature goes all the way to the Slavic nations um, just by different names. So, so just by the fact that it's seen in so many different cultures, you know it has to be a very ancient monster. Um, and it was a monster that was described with a hideous symmetry um, in, in that it had one eye and one arm and one leg. Um, <laughs> which, which you're like, wow, that sounds incredibly awkward. Yes, it is. Uh, however, it's also an incredibly terrifying monster. Um, the uh, the monster was described uh, as being jealous of other of other creatures that could fly, and and because it's so it's so uh, so jealous of that, uh, it lashes out at at uh, at all other creatures with rage, particularly those that can fly. This is this is the sort of fae who would target other fae out of jealousy. And it's that feeling of jealousy that puts it firmly in the camp of of fate that you should be able to find in the shadow felt because jealousy and sadness and loss get at the emotional heart of what that plan is supposed to represent. Uh, This is a creature that's jealous of people that have love uh, because it is described as being so hideous that it, it doesn't, it doesn't have the company and, and, and it makes it so bitter. It eschews the company of others until it doesn't, and at which time it was able to take the form uh, or or take the visage of a person where it would often head into villages and attempt to incorporate itself into that culture until it always failed because it always fails. And then in a fit of rage, it would attack the people who lived in the village, often killing the entire village. Um, it, it, it's such a it's such a, a fascinating mythology um, behind that creature. Uh, the uh, I, I I really loved it. The the one thing I was so sad about is that I couldn't incorporate the the uh, the Slavic myth of the two tailed dragon that it flew on. Um, but <laughs> but the uh, it's it's such it's such a a vivid myth because I think we can all understand the feeling of jealousy and the feeling of otherness. The, the thing that makes us feel separate from groups that we so desperately want to be a part of. Um, and this just embo- embodies that taken to an extreme uh, with the worst of our impulses added and a little bit of magical flair. So, of course, I, of I'm, course. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm happy I was able to to bring that one in uh, because, yeah, this this is a monster that has a, a long mythology um, in Europe that has sort of been ignored. But it's not anymore. Yeah. Thanks to Arcadia. That's right. That's right. We're bringing we're bringing awareness of the Fachin to everyone who who will listen. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, uh, Connor, this has been excellent. Thank you for taking us through your article. Uh, you also do a lot of stuff in the RPG community. Um, so why don't you tell people what else you're working on and where they can find you? Okay, so uh, uh, thanks for giving me an opportunity to talk about it. Um, I, I work very hard uh, in, in our spaces to create inclusive uh, spaces for people to tell uh, diverse stories. And uh, so uh, I work very hard to create events and, and things that will allow people to do that. Um, and, and advocate for that in our spaces. Uh, recent publications that I've I've put out there include the Red City, which is a a fully actualized um, a fully actualized domain of dread uh, that sort of revolves around the I, the ideas of of feelings of inadequacy, um, which I think is something many of us can empathize with as creatives or or you know dungeon masters and players also all of you out there you're creatives as well. Uh, also recently released uh, an adventure for uh, for Wizards of the Coast uh, and Adventures League, DRW 16 Uprising, um, a decolonialist adventure about uh, about helping individuals fight for their freedom. Uh, and uh, one that is premiering right now as we speak, uh, Moonshade's DRW 2, Unsee the Unseelie, where I get to tell more stories of Phage Red. Uh, they're experiencing that now at Winter Fantasy Ballman Games. Uh, and Tony Winslow Brill asked me to write that, and I, I thank them very much for the opportunity. 
Um, I've got, uh, I'm pro DM on Start Playing Games. You can check me out there. I would love to run a tale for you. And you can also look for upcoming works uh, because I've got a few coming out. Uh, on Twitter, you can find me at uh, the Healer DM, uh, a reference back to my work in mental health. Uh, you can find me online. My webpage is thehealerdm.card with two R's.com. Uh, I would love to continue the conversation with you. Uh, follow me on Twitter. Don't be surprised if I follow you back uh, because I love to hear what you're saying every bit as much as, um, as you might enjoy hearing what I have to say. Let's continue the conversation. Well, <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for uh, joining me today to talk about your article. Thank you for writing about Fae of the Shadowfell with us.